you weren't awake before, you are now. A little room to run here. Cool. Uh, sounds loud enough? Everyone in the back? Good? Sweet. Um, cool. Well, thank you everybody for coming. Uh, Howard and I are going to tell you about Elasticsearch and how we fell in love. We think after spending a little bit of time with it, you're going to fall in love too. Just for quick reference, I am the red um, lightsaber up here, laser pointer, and... I'm the green one. So if you see us, we we'll might be uh, playing. Yeah. I'm the good guy. <clears throat> uh, for, for quick, um, just to kind of get a pulse from the audience and get kind of warmed up, um, who here is using Elasticsearch? Cool, maybe like a third or something like that. Um, who here uh, is interested uh, and curious about Elasticsearch? Okay, cool. Excellent. You came um, to the right place. <laughs> and, um, it's funny that you all wandered in here. And then, so kind of of the people that are using Elasticsearch, like how many are using it kind of um, either in production or, or kind of with a cluster bigger than uh, like size of one? Yeah, so a little bit. Um, cool. That kind of gives us a little bit of frame of some of the stuff we're going to go into and what uh, might make most sense for you guys. I'm Nick Stilau. I'm director of engineering at Pantheon, um, and uh, yeah, I, I like Elasticsearch. It gets me really excited. You can do really cool stuff, and I want to share with you guys today uh, some of some of what makes it cool. And Howard thinks I'm a smooth operator, so you can see that right there. Yeah. Uh, hey, I'm Howard Tyson. I'm uh, Tizo on Drupal.org and, and everywhere else I can get it. Uh, I am. Uh, I work at ZivTech. Ziv technician is something I'm trying out. I think it's probably not the right call, though. Um, smooth Ziv technician. Smooth, smooth Ziv technician. Um, yeah, I'm the, I'm the vice president of engineering, which mostly means that uh, I'm the one that gets to play with new stuff and decide whether it's going to eat our lunch or not. And I came to the conclusion that Elasticsearch was not going to eat our lunch. It was going to buy us lunch. Um, and uh, I'm hoping to convince you of the same thing today. Yeah, so uh, we're going to do that by... Um, uh, kind of giving you an intro, going through some examples, uh, looking uh, looking at what command line, um, what uh, it looks like to interact with Elasticsearch on the command line, some basic ways, talk about clustering and stuff, uh, and we have a really cool demo lined up at the end, uh, which we kind of indexed all of the uh, Git log information from Drupal core, and we're going to show you, uh, hopefully get you guys excited about the possibility of, que of querying that and, and uh, doing some fun stuff. Yeah, I think uh, the thing that makes Elasticsearch so cool is how flexible it is. So that's kind of our example to kind of walk you guys through, like, here's a use case of looking at some data that we're all familiar with and we all care about, and, like, what can we do with that in, you know, 10 minutes at the end of the session? And it's a live demo, so what could possibly go wrong on the last day of DrupalCon? Um, and uh, this is all up online uh, as, long, as well as like a little readme that explains um, how to do the demo that we're showing here yourself. Um, gives you all the resources you need to set it up. Um, and uh, the slides that are up there need to be updated. Uh, we've got a couple of new commits uh, that, we just, that we just committed. Um, but yeah, we'll uh, push right after the session here. So Nick, what's Elasticsearch? Uh, that's a good question. I'm so glad you asked, Howard. Um, so this is uh, Elasticsearch is a distributed open source search and analytics engine designed for horizontal scalability and easy management. That's a bit of a mouthful. We're going to dig into a little bit more about what that means. So first, uh, it's distributed, right? Which um, initially, it, it really just means that right, you can, you can have um, one or more of these nodes and they can build out a cluster, which we'll talk about a little bit more and, and look at a little bit more. Um, but it's sort of built, it's the elastic in Elasticsearch, is that you can start with one of these nodes and you can just kind of start adding to it. Yeah. Um, uh, also, um, a good, like, we'll go over some concepts which are, like, generally um, uh, relevant to other distributed systems. Maybe that's Cassandra, something like that. Um, so some of the ideas we'll get into about distributed systems, which is a whole uh, kind of interesting area of computing, uh, analyzing failure modes kind of either at scale or in the uh, kind of with real world problems like, uh, you know, the network not being reliable and that kind of thing. 
Uh, it's open source, like all good things uh, at this conference and everywhere else. It's under the Apache license, so it's pretty liberal. You can kind of do what you want with it. Um, and it's document oriented. Yeah, so that basically means you're just taking kind of uh, uh, basically what can be represented by JSON, key value pairs, throw it in there. You don't have to predefine the schema or anything like that. You can kind of throw in pretty much whatever you have. Um, and uh, it accepts nested documents, that kind of stuff. So you can, um, uh, within reason, kind of think of any JSON you have and just kind of uh, put it right in Elasticsearch and start uh, playing around with it. And so here our uh, example document is uh, what we're going to be showing for our kind of demo at the end. Um, here's just an individual commit, sort of as you might see from the uh, core queue. Um, that at timestamp is kind of a, a, a pattern that people use with Elasticsearch because it makes this tool Kibana that we're going to talk about um, just sort of work out of the box, although yeah. you can do whatever. So Elasticsearch uh, is described as near real time. And uh, Cosmic Alf over here is going to point out like, well, the only difference between real time and near real time is that uh, near real time systems are not actually real time, right? So what does near real time mean? Basically, you know, ideally, um, when you put a document in Elasticsearch, ideally it's, uh, you know, the next query you do will, uh, you know, include that in the result set if it's relevant. Um, this is really to distinguish Elasticsearch from kind of batch uh, batch-based indexing, where um, it's not kind of it's not instantaneous, but it's near real time. If you reasonably kind of at the speed of a human insert a document and then query, you should get that in the result set. And it is built on Apache Lucene, like almost all uh, open source good search stuff. But Lucene is a Java library. Um, it is the same thing that powers Solar and a number of other projects. So Lucene is this, provides this Java API and you can write Java code and then you can use Lucene to really easily add um, all those fancy features like being able to do language stemming, telling that running, runs, and maybe even ran are actually the same word meaning-wise, Apple and apples, right? Um, and, and getting all that stuff right is really hard. So thankfully, the open source community largely has standardized on this Lucene thing. Uh, and then it's a question of like, a lot of us aren't Java application developers and don't want to embed the search directly into whatever we're doing. So how do we wrap that up into a nice interface? Yeah, so that kind of gives you uh, an idea of the, you know, um, differences and similarities between kind of Solar and Elasticsearch. They both have the core search technology at their core, which is Lucene. And they're basically just packing up different ways to get um, to kind of a a APIs and uh, different ways to manage and kind of make that um, easy to use. And again, the Elastic in Elasticsearch is that it's clusterable. Um, so here we've got, uh, I think, yeah, so this is a kind of snapshot of a, um, a plugin for Elasticsearch, which kind of lets you visualize what's going on with the cluster. So this is uh, our clustered Pantheon, which um, consists of five different nodes. Um, you can kind of see those on the left column. Um, so there's a couple of different things going on here. Uh, we have two data nodes and two and three master nodes. So um, in a distributed system, uh, you're, uh, there's um, uh, res one responsibility part of that system is uh, is um, the um, the kind of management of that cluster. So, by definition, distributed system is in you know multiple locations, usually multiple servers, could even be different data centers, and something needs the responsibility to understand which data should be where, what the health of the overall cluster is. So, in this case, we have three. Um, three kind of manage, uh, management master nodes. And what happens is um, they have a consensus algorithm to uh, go through a process called leader election to pick out the current master who's gonna know the most about the cluster and kind of be the authoritative so source at that point in time for what's going on. So you can see the little uh, star on the left is designating that that, uh, that that node out of the three is the current master. Um, and um, so, yeah, here, like, kind of using different different um, different servers to separate the different roles. One role is to have the data and serve the data, which we're indexing, and the other role is to kind of manage the cluster and know about which which node um, uh, which node should have which data and that sort of thing. Um, so moving uh, over to the right a little bit, uh, so each of the verticals there represents a different index. So you can see on that that leftmost index that Howard is uh, pointing to. Um, 
uh, there are five what are called shards, and that are kind of, those are kind of um, uh, um, kind of sections of your data. And you can see on the leftmost column, um, the two data nodes each have uh, a box indicating that they have data. So shard zero is on each node, shard one is on each node, and that's because we've set a replica. Um, uh, we've um, configured it to have a replica. So that data is stored on two different nodes so that if one goes down, we still have that data. Now, if you look at the other um, indexes we have, which are log data, so these, are, these do not have a replica, replica configured. So this um, is a trade-off where maybe this data isn't super important. We don't mind if, uh, if it, if it, um, if it uh, gets lost, so we don't need to replicate it. Um, and that lets us kind of scale out uh, um, uh, for like a heavier data set acro um, across more servers. So a important, important thing to get into is talking <laughs> with some people last night quite a bit about is kind of about data, data security and um, uh, uh, integrity on the uh, in Elasticsearch. So Elasticsearch is not MySQL. It's not trying to be. It's not trying to be like a transactional, highly consistent um, data store. Uh, Joe Miller is an engineer at Pantheon who helped set up our cluster. And he wanted, uh, he wanted sarcastically to let uh, you all know that you should, um, it's a great primary data store for all your critical mutable data. That's not true. That's not what you want to be uh, using Elasticsearch for. There's a great series called uh, the Call Me, ba Call Me Maybe series uh, of blog posts about distributed systems. And the joke uh, kind of popular cultural reference is like in distributed systems, you know, you may or may not kind of uh, get that call back or, you know, the data may or may not actually get there. And um, so I, I love this one little, little quote from the, from the analysis of the new Elasticsearch, which is, you know, the Elasticsearch marketing website is all, um, you know, we put your data first. And after, like, really digging into the code, uh, specifically coming out saying, well, to be precise, it's not putting your data first putting it zero to five seconds after you write the data, and if the server was to blow up within those five seconds, you're not guaranteed to have that data. So this should help kind of frame uh, how you can um, use Elasticsearch, not as a primary data store. It's great if you can, you know, use uh, MySQL to regenerate the index data. Um, other stuff, uh, um, like in our case, we're going to be going through the Git log, so we can blow away uh, all of Elasticsearch, rerun the Git log stuff from uh, Drupal core and get all that back in as index data. The Call Me Maybe series is, is really fascinating, too. I highly recommend checking that out as extended reading, where they sort of, um, he sort of takes all these, uh, these distributed systems that promise to be able to survive all kinds of partitions and failures and stuff, and um, he starts finding out, like, what happens when you really start just unplugging the plugs while they're running. Um, does a really nice job of that. Dude, Nick, I don't know why I should care about Elasticsearch. I've been searching for nodes since, like, 2005, man. Uh, you, you may have been searching, but you haven't been searching in style. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, like a lot of people, I think I started out doing search in MySQL. Um, you know, you, uh, you just kind of throw everything into MySQL, and it's your answer for everything, so you just start doing your search there. It's the kind of thing that we all sort of experiment with in college, like a lot of other things. Uh, but like those other things, at some point you kind of need to grow out of that college age experimentation and realize that, like, actually I'm a grown up now and, like, I shouldn't be doing these filthy things to my database. And even if you don't run into the performance issues, you know, I think you really just end up with uninspired results. And we want to, uh, you know, we want to inspire ourselves and our, our customers and make awesome websites. Yeah, my SQL search uh, not only will bring your site to a screech, screeching halt, uh, but it also has the benefit of giving you terrible search results. Um, so Elasticsearch versus Solar, we kind of got at this a little bit before. Um, you know, they're both Apache 2 licensed, they're both supported by big commercial companies that are, like, that are pushing them, they both support HTTP indexes. Um, we're not going to go spend a whole time running this down. Solar versus Elasticsearch.com will give you your giant wall of checklists. Um, every time somebody adds a checklist on one side, the other organizations like run and try to um, add it on the other side as well. There are some features that are on one and not the other, and if you really care about one of those, it could be a decider for you. 
Yeah, um, but really, um, you know, when you look at kind of the checkbox-based comparison, you're like, well, they're, they're pretty much the same. This one has this feature that I don't really get or need or something, and this one has this other. But uh, really what it comes down to, uh, to me, is more of like a gut feeling, that kind of inspiration, those aha moments that uh, I feel like I really just get playing with uh, Elasticsearch. So, uh, I, I was, you know, talking with people who use Elasticsearch for... Um, uh, you know, Drupal and Word, WordPress stuff and, uh, you know, some pretty, some pretty big sites doing some really cool stuff. And, you know, they're kind of like, well, I, I guess it is apples to apples, but, you know, it's kind of like this mealy, wormy, you know, gross apple and you want the, like, fresh off the, you know, tree, red delicious, so. Elasticsearch is the new apple, if yeah, anybody if, didn't. If, <laughs> yeah. Um. <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, also, like, there, it's not just about the product. It's also about the documentation. Um, I mean, I've been working with Solar for, I don't know, eight years or something now. And every time I need to learn how to do something, I, it's just this deep sigh. And I'm like, can I just not do that? Can I make views do this, maybe? Um, because every time you dig into their documentation, it's just this stupid rabbit hole. And you keep getting links to, like, Java docs for Lucene queries. And like maybe you'll find the way to do it, but you don't even know where to look. And when you download Solar, even today, you get like an example folder. It's not like here's the thing, run it. It's like here's a way you could run it with Jetty, I guess. Um, you download Elasticsearch. There's a bin folder with a bash script called Elasticsearch, and you just run that. And just wait for the demo because we're gonna run that script about six times. Does anyone know what Sphinx is? Has anyone used it? Sweet. Awesome. Well, I wasn't sure too much about it. So Sphinx is another option. I was going to make a joke about nobody raising their ha hand and not needing to talk about it much, which is why there's no slide content. But um, uh, <laughs> We were so I'm... sure there wouldn't be a single <laughs> hand, and there were two. Uh, so um, talk to anyone who raised their hand if you want to know about how it compares to Sphinx better. <laughs> Uh, and then I was just going to make a little um, a little jab here. In case you're wondering how many capitals are in Elasticsearch, it's it's just one, so you don't need to write code that changes that. Nick's really excited that Pantheon now supports WordPress. Um, uh, you know, there, there ain't no party like a curl party. So we figured, you know, that was probably the best way to show you guys how you actually use this stuff. Yeah, you're probably not going to be, like, you know, shelling out to bash and curl in your production systems, but just the fact that, we, you know, you can do it in curl on the command line, uh, you know, kind of gives you an idea of how simple it is, and we can all translate that in our heads, how that would map to the, the code we're writing for HTTP. Um, that, uh, that second thing of curl there is a bug. Um, That's yeah, so fun. It's as you can see awesome. here... As you can see here, this uh, if you don't create an index, you can just start throwing documents into Elasticsearch, and it'll create one for you uh, and try to figure out what the mappings can be. Uh, but if you do in deliberately create an index, you can actually tell it um, how many shards. So that's kind of like how many slices uh, Elasticsearch should carve your data into, and then those slices are what get distributed among the servers. So. Um, a lot of the time, you could probably let Elasticsearch make that decision for you, but if you only have a single node, it might be a good idea to just say one. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, number of replicas is how many duplicate safe copies you want of this data sitting around. So um, here we're ensuring that if some node dies, we're not going to lose any data. But this is like details you might learn along the way after, or just, we're just uh, you know, trying to fall in love here, so we can kind of ignore that stuff. It's the first date, you know? You don't yeah. have to. Um, so, uh, and here is uh, inserting a document. Pretty simple. And here again, you can see this is like all stuff you'd get out of the git log, commit uh, ref, committer name, author name, some date stuff, what the you know commit message was. And when you get this back, uh, you, it kind of tells you where it, where it put it in log stash, what the ID and what the version of, the, um, of that document is. And hey, it's crud, so you can update it too. Um, replace that post with a put, and uh, put the ID that you got back when you put the first record in, and you can push some updates to the same thing, and it'll tell you that the version of this document is now two, because um, you've updated it. And two comes after one, so it works out well. Um, uh, you can actually do partial updates too, but it it's, uh, kind of involves uh, going deeper. So. Um, Sort of the simple crud, you push a new document in, it completely replaces the old one. 
Uh, and here, you know, again, this is crud, so this is the retrieve part. Separate from search, um, you can just grab a document by name. Cool. Let's get to the meaty stuff. Uh, so here, maybe the use case, uh, we have this all this uh, uh, Git data in there, and like, I want to find commits by XJM uh, matching with a subject matching views. So here, uh, the kind of two key parts of the search are what the query is. So that can be a, a Lucene query, which can, you can get kind of fancy with, uh, and then the filter. So in this case, the filter is going to restrict only uh, only results where the author name is XJM, and then um, within that, it's going to use the query to um, find matching matching results. Nick, did you? No, I didn't. I didn't put this in. Do you? Is it? Is this like a metaphor for like Elasticsearch or something? I think. I mean, I feel like solar is the thing that kind of blows. Yeah, I don't, maybe, I can't, um, yeah, I let's, just, let's just move on, okay. let's just move on. Uh, okay, so, so far you've just seen, like, you can throw some stuff in it, you can pull some stuff back out, you can do a search, right? Like, solar probably would have looked pretty much exactly the same so far. So, what can Elasticsearch do that solar can't? Um, yeah, so I think, um, think about Arthur Clark, Clark's, um, uh, laws. I guess you just get to make, make laws. He was a science fiction writer, but about the one about any uh, sufficiently advanced technology being indistinguishable from magic, and especially when you start getting start uh, using Elasticsearch, it kind of feels like magic. So we're going to try to um, try to communicate that to you. So um, one really cool thing that Elasticsearch has is this ability to create histograms. Where if you've ever used Photoshop and you see like the layout of an image and you can see like how many pixels are totally dark and how many pixels are totally red, light and like what the distribution is. Um, I feel like if most people have encountered a histogram outside of this context, that's probably the kind of thing they've seen. Uh, well, Elasticsearch makes it super easy to uh, make histograms of kind of like any kind of data. It's built in as like a primitive um, kind of query where you can say how you want to do um, a histogram query, how you want to do different um, bucketing to sort of, uh, even in a nested way, use bucketing to um, sort of structure, take all the things that fit into this category and, and give me overall counts and, and structure and then um, even subdivide within that. So this is a little snapshot from uh, our log, uh, log um, uh, centralized logging at Pantheon. Uh, you can see kind of, uh, so this is being bucketed on the timestamp field and it's bucketed per one hour. And you can see on the bottom there kind of um, uh, how many how many of those different uh, events on Pantheon are happening um, over over those one hour uh, one hour one hour periods, and then the same thing uh, for count split up by um, by role. So there's like 164,000 uh, events that were caused by the super user. Um, Nick, do you want to talk us through the score boosting? I sure do. So this is a pretty cool use case, right? So this is where we kind of start to get a little bit of inspiration into our search results. So you're like, okay, I have, you know, I have a lot of nodes. I have, I don't know, 10,000 nodes. And uh, what would be really cool is if we could really boost those, boost the search results based on um, what the popular nodes are. Like, okay, cool. Let's figure out how to do that. Uh, where do we store data about what our uh, you know popular nodes are? Okay, Google Analytics. All right, so you could write a quick script that just goes to Google Analytics, gets gets a list of each of um, you know the top hundred uh, most popular um, uh, pages on your site, and um, uh, put that into Elasticsearch along along. Um, uh, along with that document, uh, we could just make a custom field, maybe call it like GA rank or something like that. So we'd have 100 articles with a GA rank between 0 and 100, or 1 and 100. Um, and we can use this, uh, the kind of function score multiple. And as you can see in this snippet, we're going to say origin is 0. And that means the closer it is to 0, the more you want to boost, uh, boost that uh, search result. And then we only really care about the top kind of 100. So after 100, don't really give it much of a boost factor. Um, and so in this case, pretty, pretty straightforward to have a little um, conscript or whatever, which hits Google Analytics, gets your most popular articles, um, uh, updates, updates Elasticsearch with that ranking, and then uh, really easily on all your search results, boost those popular articles to the top. 
You could even take this further uh, using the same kind of function and get um, popular articles that were recently published. And so this is where kind of start of the, you can start to see the, um, the, the power uh, and inspiration and flexibility in Elasticsearch. Uh, Elasticsearch also has like geo fields, so you can, you can, uh, you can also, I've, I've heard about people um, arranging things in a two-dimensional space so that then you can do searches based on proximity of like not just latitude and longitude but any two values um, to create like a two-dimensional plane and then do um, like regional searches based on that. You can get really crazy with this cool stuff. stuff. Um, percolate. Percolate is a kind of bizarre feature that's uh, really cool. So what it lets you do in the abstract is store a set the word should be there, <laughs> store a set of queries, and then use documents to ask which queries would find this document. So you can basically like, hey, say, hey, Solar, or sorry, Solar. Hey, uh, Solar's just like, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> so then you ask Elasticsearch. Hey, Elasticsearch, uh, I want you to remember this search where I want to find all of the uh, commits by Jess, uh, and then I want you to remember this one for like all of the commits that are related to security. And then you can start taking individual documents and saying, like, is which of these does this match? One, both, all. So yeah, yo dog, I heard you like search. So I put a search in your search so you can search for your searches. Which uh, is actually this is actually just taken from the Elasticsearch uh, documentation page. <laughs> So kind of bring that back to our example about this, uh, the Drupal core commit uh, git log stuff. Um, so a cool way we could use this is to kind of classify those commits. So maybe we'll make one percolator called security. We'll say, hey, if it has XSS in the message or security in it, uh, then it matches that. We'll have another one called admin UI, and we'll say, hey, if it has admin and UI in the message, then that counts as a hit for um, admin UI. Uh, what we can do then is say we just get one of our uh, commit messages coming through and we can query Elasticsearch uh, and say, hey, I have this commit with this message, what does it match? In this case, we'd get some results back that say, hey, you know what, that matches security. And we could use that to then tag that commit and have, uh, you know, have that um, kind of tag in the, in the database. So it's a cool way to kind of classify, classify data. So yeah, basically like here we just push a couple of uh, queries, the same kind that we could just run against the documents that are indexed, um, right? And that creates, that stores those. And then we can just chuck a document at it and it'll tell us which of those queries match, which can be a really cool way to do something like alerting. Like maybe if you're aggregating PHP error logs, um, you could say like anytime I find a stack trace, uh, or you could say like, follow syslog, and if I ever find OOM, then like wake somebody up. Um, right, so uh, it's a really cool way to do that. One note, um, it doesn't like auto tag. It's not like you can say I'm adding this, run these queries, and then tag it with what matched. You'd have to do that yourself. But it's just a way to sort of like take this search and turn it inside out, where instead of storing all the documents and then asking questions about it, you can store all the questions and then throw documents in um, to find which questions matched. Um, which just opens you up to doing a whole bunch of stuff that I never would have thought about before. So integrating Drupal with Elasticsearch. Um, there's a few ways to do it. Some of them are better than others. Uh, there's a couple of different Drupal modules you can use. The one that you might be inclined to reach for, who here uses Search API? Yeah. So you'd, like me, search Search API Elasticsearch and be like, oh, hey, there's an integration. Perfect. This will be just like Solar. I'll just plug it in and it'll work, right? Uh, what's nice is that Search API Elasticsearch has really complete integration right now with all of Search API's features. You can set up all the different a uh, analysis steps and you can reorder them and you can do um, all kinds of different uh, query creation and it sort of does all the same things that you'd expect Solar, uh, that you would expect after working with Search API and Solar. Um, the bad is that it's gonna just error all the time and like maybe lose your data. So. Um, I think if you want to chip in on the, like, let's get Drupal working well with uh, Search API uh, and Elasticsearch, um, this is a really great place for contributions. So um, I don't know the maintainer, but I suspect patches are probably welcome. Um, there's another module called the Elasticsearch Connector. Um, this, I think, is sort of more interesting and much more, um, much more complete. 
Uh, and it's a nice framework for an API where you can define these clusters or, indice or indexes that you have um, in sort of the abstract globally within your Drupal site. And then you can use that from all these different sub-modules that it ships with. So there's one with views integration, which I can show if we have time. I'm not sure if we'll have time. Uh, and that'll actually, you can go in and when you're creating a view, it'll find all the indexes in Elasticsearch and make them available as things you can create views of. And then it introspects the index and finds all the fields that are in there and exposes those as well. Um, so you don't have to be using uh, Drupal to even be putting the stuff into Elasticsearch. It can be getting into Elasticsearch from curl, and then you can like use views to just build lists of it on your site, um, which is pretty awesome. It also comes with a cool statistics module um, that sort of like Google Analytics style will just chuck every authenticated page request, or every non-cached page request, anything that's not hitting varnish or whatever, um, in there so that you can like then make uh, views and histograms and all kinds of things of um, what's actually happening in your site. Um, the bad, the uh, search API integration is also there. So this module also ships with search API integration. Um, the thing is it doesn't enable a lot of the features that you'd be looking for. So like you can't adjust whether it's stripping or like whether it's doing highlighting or a whole bunch of other features that are really nice that are built into search API and work with solar. Um, if you're trying to decide for my Drupal site, should I use Elasticsearch or solar um, for like my primary content search? I just want to like index all my nodes. I'm sorry to say this at an Elasticsearch talk, but just use Solar. You'll be happier with your life. It's uh, more complete. It's more well tested. Uh, and for like Elast you know, Search API kind of gives you like not the lowest common denominator, but a common interface across these like back ends so that, you know, in theory you can't even tell whether this is Solar or Mongo or Elasticsearch or whatever. Um, as like a lowest common denominator that only has all the shared features, like you're not going to get much out of Solar over Elasticsearch. Maybe next year we'll have better news. What's that? Maybe next year, uh, <laughs> you know, we'll uh, sing a different tune, yeah. Yeah. And maybe uh, Acquia and Pantheon will add Elasticsearch hosting so we can, like, really use it on all our sites, right? Um, you betcha. <clears throat> uh, the other thing that you can do with Drupal and Elasticsearch is uh, log aggregation. So there's a couple different ways to do that. Um, one is you can use this cool new module by Amitai Bernstein um, logs HTTP, and uh, you don't actually need any other intermediary. You can actually just wire this up and just say, like, let's say you had your uh, Elasticsearch instance running locally. You can just say my endpoint is that uh, URL wherever I can hit solar slash HTTP logs. This will create an index if it doesn't already exist um, slash message, and that'll just start creating those messages in that log. And you can say what log severity, and you can define a field for each environment so that dev staging and production can be differentiated. And that's all you need to do. Now you have um, all of your log data coming through Watchdog automatically being put into Elasticsearch, which is pretty cool. Uh, another thing that you can do to do this is use the uh, GELF module that I think Mark Sonnebaum wrote originally, right? Uh, the illustrious and lovely Mark Sonnebaum in the front of the room here. Um, and so with GELF, you can, you can pair GELF with this tool Logstash, which we're going to talk about more in a minute. Um, or the module, the, uh, the system that it was actually designed to be used with, uh, Graylog, which is this other log aggregation thing that also uses Elasticsearch, actually. Um, and they have this, like, kind of JSON format. And so this module will post that JSON format. So you can either have this go straight into Graylog, or you could um, pass it through Logstash into Elasticsearch. Two really good ways to get those logs in, especially if you're doing other log aggregation, finding your MySQL slow query log, your Apache access log, whatever. You can make like a unified log stream of all of that stuff so that you can look in one place and kind of identify like um, which sorts of requests were having these kinds of problems and, and have that in one place. Yeah, and this is an awesome way just to get some data in Elasticsearch and then you can start playing with it. <laughs> it also kind of speaks, uh, yeah, to, um, there are two like general primary use cases right now um, uh, for like around the kind of the, on the um, Drupal side. So one is uh, helping you actually serve your um, search results better to your end users. And then the other is more of a kind of operational tool to understand what's happening on your site. And that's where kind of having the logs might help you see if you're being attacked or what pages are 404-ing or kind of what your traffic patterns are or anything like that. Um, so the other way, wow, uh, this monitor is really low 
uh, contrast. Um, the other way that you can do it is just using custom code. So um, this is a little snippet from a module that I wrote for a, <laughs> uh, for a Drupal 6 Ubercart site. So this Drupal 6 Ubercart site has like some of the screaming fast, most cutting edge uh, search technology uh, of any site that I've worked on in Ubercart. Um, sorry, I'm just sharing my pain. I just want a little validation here. Um, so, uh, so here's an example of, uh, of how you can just like write this code um, and you can see it's gonna sort of look a lot like the stuff that we were seeing in the examples before. Um, this is using one of the Elasticsearch clients uh, that I think are sort of officially listed from the um, Elasticsearch documentation. So you can see here like I just have this client class and I'm calling indexes, uh, indices create and I'm handing in this description that says um, um, the number of shards, one, the number of replicas, zero. I don't care if this data goes away, I can just re-index it. Um, it's defining um, auto-suggest uh, completion things so that uh, Elasticsearch has a built-in feature. You don't have to just do a full search. Um, it has a bunch of sort of like memory optimization stuff for doing type ahead. So you can tell it kind of like what fields you should be able to do type ahead on and uh, it'll make that really fast for you. And then here's some custom code to query. Um, you'll see here um, I'm taking just some search phrase and I'm telling it what fields to search across and then I'm giving it uh, Lucene, um, what are they called, boosts? Yeah, boost factor. Uh, Lucene boost factor where I'm saying if it's in the name, which is the username, um, give it a boost of plus four. If it's, the, if it's within the full name, then a two. And then if it's in any of these other fields, um, neutral, no better, no worse. Um, so, uh, right, create the index, uh, perform searches on it. Um, I don't have a slide for pushing stuff in, but it's kind of exactly what you'd expect. You just make an object and you call this method on client to say um, index this. Um, so in like 100 lines of code, you can actually just create your own custom search um, if, if this other stuff doesn't sort of work for you. If you can't just plug in Elasticsearch uh, or you know one of these Elasticsearch integration modules or the Solar integration module, it's really not a lot of code to write your own custom integrations, um, especially as clean and well documented as the Elasticsearch API is. So here I needed like really good user search in Drupal 6 uh, with uh, address data from Ubercart. And like I was able to write that in a day. Um, and it way outperformed um, all the other stuff that we had tried out for it. Um, so that's kind of the, like most of the Drupal use case, but the thing is, part of what's given Elasticsearch so much in the way of legs is um, how well it works for DevOpsy people. Yeah. Sweet. Um, so we want to introduce you to the, what's called the Elk stack. So this is Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana. So these are all kind of three tools provided by Elastic Co., which is the company kind of behind this. Uh, this gets us to some cool use cases. This is kind of what we use it for at Pantheon for centralized logging. This is basically like the killer app for a lo logs uh, for Elasticsearch. Um, I think this is a way a lot of um, people, organizations will start using Elasticsearch is that kind of like the operations team, tech ops, dev ops, whatever it is, kind of are like, hey, let's use this. It's like a really get great way to look at our logs, see what's happening on the, on the system so we don't have to log into each different server when something goes wrong. Uh, and then, you know, that this might be a way that people kind of fall in love with uh, Elasticsearch and, uh, and then bring it to other parts of the organization. Um, so we went over a couple ways, right? Like the key is to get your data into Elasticsearch and that's when the fun begins. Howard went over a couple of, uh, you know, cool easy ways to get that in. Uh, maybe something like a Drupal Logs HTTP module. You know, you can just hook up uh, syslog or um, journal D if you're running a uh, system D based distro like Fedora. Um, or you can kind of get, there's lots of ways to get your logs in. Um, so. Like. And, and there's a contrib project that has even more, like uh, a thing that'll read DB log records out of your Drupal database. That ships with Logstash contrib. Yeah. Don't, don't do that. <laughs> um, uh, but super flexible, so there's a lot of cool ways. So, uh, so is the logs, you're th kind of thinking about, you know, logs aren't like a thing, uh, an entry in a file, right? Logs are kind of events that are happening on your system. So the idea of a log stream is kind of that these events, you know, are kind of happening in different places. Maybe that place is, um, 
you know, Nginx or maybe it's Drupal, and those events are emitted. Uh, they go through this kind of log pipeline, and so Logstash is going to be uh, kind of um, uh, the first step on this logging pipeline. So if you see, bringing it back to the um, to the uh, Drupal Git data, something like, hey, this issue, whatever, is fixing uh, XHTML slash. Um, and uh, in our log slash configuration, we can have this little grok. And what the grok will do is it'll split out um, the issue ID into its own field. So before, we just had kind of, you know, you can think of just straight text as kind of like, it's kind of dumb, it's just one string, it's not super interesting but then you can pass it through Logstash through these kind of, you know, regexy grok things, and then you get rich data out. So the rich data is more kind of like a key value pair. You can see at the bottom the issue ID is kind of broken out, the issue message is broken out, um, and the original message. And, um, yeah, so rich data is really cool. We'll, we'll tell you, uh, we'll, we'll go into that in the demo. Um, but basically the richer your data is, uh, the more you'll be able to kind of query it and play with it. If you just stick in, every, if every document you put in Elasticsearch is just one line, one string, that's not, you know, you can still search against that, but it's not super interesting. So the richer you can get, the more kind of key values, uh, you can start to do some fun stuff. Moving on. Um, yeah, so like uh, Logstash, Elk Stack is a great way to kind of, you know, uh, just understand what's happening in your system in near real time. Maybe that's attacks happening on your system, maybe that's kind of investigating a security breach or something that broke and how did that user kind of get to that step, um, diagnose an outage that happened, all the, all the things that you'd use Watchdog for, but in a way that you can kind of query and play with in interesting ways. Like for example, that uh, informed Nick and the guys at Pantheon that uh, I'm at the top of the leaderboard for failed login attempts. Apparently somebody knows that my email address has an account on uh, Pantheon and they're just trying to brute force my password. And so like he was able to show me on this like graph, like oh look, there you are, you're right at the top of the list of all the people trying to break into Pantheon. It's, it's either that or Howard wrote some bad automation <laughs> in a tight loop that's like... <laughs> it, really, it really could go either way. Yeah. Sweet. So... Um, uh, so we're going to jump into a demo, um, and you guys can get kind of a better feel of, um, of the power at your fingertips. So this is, um, this is the K, the Kibana in the Elk stack, is this uh, dashboard which lets you kind of, uh, kind of query, um, you know, interact with uh, Elasticsearch on the back end. Um, so this right now is kind of, uh, you know, a web UI, a little dashboard we threw together that's on top of Elasticsearch with all of the um, Git, uh, Git log data for Drupal core. So Howard can go into more detail. Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to show you the how I put this together, but figured I'd start with the context of what this is and kind of show you the power of all this stuff that we've been talking about. Um, at uh, the last DrupalCon, Austin, I also had a talk that overlapped with Elasticsearch, and I also had a live demo, and that one exploded in flames. Um, so fair warning. <laughs> um, so here what we have is uh, a Kibana dashboard, like Nick said, of all of the commits in Drupal core. Um, I, this is a couple of days, this is a little bit old, I think there's actually like 28,000 now. Um, this last import, I'm not sure I got quite everything. Um, but uh, yeah, so what we can do is we can just sort of just play with this stuff and um, start making these lists. So Kibana doesn't know anything about core commit data, right? Um, but what I was able to do was um, create this log stash rule uh, and, and Nick and I put together this thing that would parse the um, output from a custom sort of git log format and then ingest all that stuff into Elasticsearch. So you can see here, I know this is a little small, um, but you can see here like the, the timestamp, you can see the author, the, com the git commit author was webchick, um, you can see that the email address she was using was her magic uh, drupal.org one to keep her personal email quiet private. Um, then you'll also see some other structured data that wasn't structured um, in the git commit, right? So like the issue, which used that grok filter that Nick mentioned, I'll show you the code in a second, um, to extract that because it followed that normal Drupal pattern of issue, 
you know, colon space pound and the, the issue, as you can see on the next line. And then we also use that to repackage it up as a link to the Drupal.org issue. So you can just click that and jump right to it. So, um, and then, uh, yeah, I'm, this is pretty cool. So, right, there's colors, there's pie charts, there's a histogram. We see some log entries, right? So let's uh, maybe just start playing around. So who, who wants to look up, um, who knows a core committer by name and, that we want to investigate a little bit? Call it out. Sonobom. <laughs> hey, there we go. So there are 43 commits that are nice tagged work. Mark Sonobom. <laughs> and uh, we can see uh, of Mark Sonobom's commits, uh, we've, got, uh, we've got a tie. Oh, no, Alex Pot. Alex Pot commits the most stuff. So if Mark wants to get something in, he now knows who he should probably talk to. Alex is going to be the most uh, sympathetic to Mark, followed maybe by uh, Web Chicken Catch. Yeah. Had, had a killer year. Yeah. It's almost making like a middle finger with the commit. Yeah. Got it. Was that Mark, is, uh, Mark is flipping us all off with yeah. his commit statistics. Uh, 25 of them in 2012. Uh, Mark. Big year. What happened? Yeah, I'm done now. You done? He's you, done. You did it. He's you, done. You, 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 you did it all, yeah. Um, and then so the uh, the other the little table there is um, is uh, is, by, it's is the, a histogram by ish, issue. So on the left, it's the issue number, and then it's how many commits were committed for that issue number. So you can see that when Mark was committing every uh, issue he addressed, he addressed with a single commit. Bam. But if we take off uh, the the filter on Mark, we can see that wow, this one um, this one issue uh, six four two zero um, took twenty one commits to do. We're like, what is that? Okay, they they were all done by Dries. Uh, let's dig in a little bit more. Let's see, it was uh, it was all in two thousand five. Okay, we're we're learning the story here a little bit. There we go. We see that it uh, had something to do with renaming aggregator module. But then he. But then also all do the other want, commits. Do we want to know more? Well, <laughs> but, yeah. So look at the other commits there. Oh, that's renaming. Um, looks like a lot of module renaming. So I don't know. I'm just kind of putting this together. But maybe there's an issue that um, you know is kind of doing a, a refactor in the code base, renaming or moving it around, and uh, instead of lumping in that into one huge commit, which would be scary to push, uh, there was one issue queue on uh, one issue on D.0, but that actually happened in a number of commits. I would imagine just to make the um, you know the if it's a refactor to kind of make it a little more sane. And then we have that nice uh, feature here. We can actually just click that link. Any link will automatically uh, you know, format itself properly. And yeah, we can see here's the Drupal.org issue split modules into their own directories. Sweet. Interesting. So that required more commits than any other thing in uh, Drupal core history. We're learning here. Um, uh, and H Howard and I are excited to use, use this um, database to uh, to give us a leg up at trivia tonight we think we can really yeah um, yeah and then we can just say like oh what about a different time interval so I was looking at the last 15 years but what if I just wanted to look at the last year so there we go we have a lot less committers and we can see kind of a different graph here it's a little bit more detailed it's now automatically um, splitting things up by day so this is the last year by day. I can see that the most commits happened on uh, January 11th. Interesting. Alex Pot, 62% of the commits. Ooh. So he is either just really working hard or his standards are a little lower. <laughs> um, just teasing. Um, you can see that we've got 35 by catch. We've got 33 by... Uh, XJM, Jennifer Hodgson, 64, right? It's just really easy to start exploring these. And again, we can click on any one of these and it'll refilter. So now, um, now we're seeing just the commits that, uh, and again, this is being pulled from author data. So there's some uh, overlap with between usernames and actual names, depending on what people had in their Git config at the time they committed it. Yeah, you can also track kind of people's identity as their name or, you know, uh, um, handle change over time.
One other nice feature, Logstash automatically will um, create uh, two different indexes. One is the raw and the other one is the analyzed uh, copy of the field. So one is like broken up by tokens, but the other one has the full value, which allows you to kind of do different things here depending on the nature of that data. Yeah, and if you remember back to when we were writing a query in curl, there were two parts of it. There was the query and then there were filters. And so that totally maps to the top section of Kibana there. Um, so the top is the, is the query, and then uh, below that there are the filters. And so that, that we're filtering by a specific author, and then we're querying for, what did you type in there, Howard? Security. Security, so uh, um, for security commits uh, for this author, um, uh, and you can see those issues there. Actually, I split out the author. So we are requiring okay. author, so anything that's missing an author um, doesn't show up. Okay. Um, that's because the way I did the uh, log output, uh, we were kind of losing any commit that had quotes in the message. Eh, it's a little imperfect. Version, could use, well, could use be, a little. That'll little be fixed in version two. Yeah, version two of this talk. Um, yeah, what, uh, can someone shout out something else we want to search for for in Drupal commits? What do you want to search for? Yes. Hmm. Oh, interesting, yeah. So we'd first probably, we want to go back for a while, and then, um, yeah, you know, because we're not sure when that happened, and um, uh, might want to uh, uh, query, query in just on both of those names, and, I don't know. Let's see, if I pick this. Um, so we can see where it's, it, it started. Actually, it might be easier to do uh, up here with yeah. catch or oh yeah yeah Elasticsearch just fixes that for you so you don't have to worry about it so. It's um, so if I clicked on either one of these, I could see that uh, the oldest one here is uh, from 2012, December. Um, if I dropped that filter, I could see that um, the oldest one here is uh, 2012, December. I think he just has two computers, and they're configured differently, maybe. Yes, I think we <laughs> It seems like the exact same uh, breakdown. What's up? What, by like? Yeah, type in one query. Oh, right, the plus, yeah. Um, yeah, and this is like really fun to play with, pretty visual. You can get, uh, you can get kind of funky with it, um, but it maps really well to just even what you'd be doing with curl, um, and it's a pretty cool way, once you can get some data in Elasticsearch, to start playing with it. So we can try to get two queries up here, and then another thing um, I want to show you is exactly uh, Right, cool. So we can see the, um, those two queries uh, showing up with the different colors on the histogram on the left. So it does Yeah, so we can even see how much of uh, each one, right? So of this year, 473 of them um, were catch and 891 were Nathaniel catch. Cool. So do you, do you think the yellow is his laptop and the other is desktop? I don't know. Uh, but can do some fun or, stuff. Or the catch is actually just in the uh, email address, so that's why it's hitting both. Um, Howard, can you, show, can you do an inspect on that, uh, that histogram? Yes. First I wanted to see, oh, interesting, huh. Um, so if we do an inspect, you're actually going to see how awesome is that? It actually prints out the curl command that you'd run to run this query yourself in the command line against um, the uh, index. So while we're doing live demos, it might crash and burn. Howard, do you want to just copy and paste that and see, uh, see if we get results on the command line? What could possibly go wrong? Something. Amitai always tells me you should do more live demos. Yeah. So, something, something with the white space could go wrong. 
Uh, and this is also a cool way, right? So you get some data in, and then you can actually just do this inspect and kind of see uh, the, the a little more advanced queries that Kaban is generating for you to kind of learn some of that cool syntax. So there we go. What we see coming back out, uh, this took three milliseconds, I guess. Uh, it didn't time out. It hit five different shards. Um, three were successful, zero failed. Um, we had uh, 17,000 hits. Um, and then uh, we can see that it's, it's breaking things down by term here, and we can see exactly how many fell into each one of these categories. Cool, so we have about 10 minutes left. Um, and uh, uh, again, the, um, on github.com slash tizzo, um, uh, the examples and all the slides are up here, so we can, uh, you guys can play around with that. We can also walk you through um, if you have any questions, uh, ping either of us. Um, but uh, this is a cool way to you know, have some fun, do some exploring. Um, this is the kind of stuff I love to do at Pantheon with our logs and kind of under, you know, understand, try to um, do a little bit of sleuthing and figure out what, uh, what stories the logs are telling you um, in some cool ways. Um, so I think Howard's gonna go over a little bit of, uh, um, Oh, actually, continue the demo to more like command line, how we're like going to spin up uh, the kind of cluster clustering aspect. Um, can you guys see that? You can just command plus two. Yeah, I just wanted to see if I could. Uh... Yes. So this is just the Elasticsearch download. If I just run Elasticsearch. I just spun up a new node. Uh, it automatically named itself with a Marvel character, Lady Killer. I don't know what her deal is, but uh, apparently she's one of the characters. Um, and in theory, in just a second here, um, we should see a new node just sort of pop up. Wow, I think I have a sort of split brain on my own machine. Live demos. Um, um, cool, well, I think uh, maybe now is a good time um, to just uh, open up for QA if anybody has any particular questions about Elasticsearch or this uh, commit data. I think if you could get up to the mic, that would help us, or, or you can shout and I'll repeat it. But. Um, the question was uh, about Kibana 3 versus Kibana 4. Um, um, I, Kibana 4 is going to be awesome. Uh, it's going to be better than Kibana 3. Uh, um, I think we just, um, I, haven't, I haven't used Kibana 4, but I'm, I, I'll, you know, it's on the list, so for me. <laughs> What's up? Yeah, so the question was uh, about using, um, experience using uh, um, uh, existing web crawlers like Nutch or otherwise to put data into Elasticsearch. Um, no, I haven't, um, um, but it sounds like an awesome, awesome, <laughs> awesome project. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, it seems, it seems like it would be totally possible. You know, and I think that to me the idea that it's so clear what's happening because you can use Elasticsearch so easily that I'm not even sure the specifics of Nutch, but it seems like there's got to be a way to make that happen. It might take a little duct tape and glue to go from whatever format Nutch likes to kind of an output that looks like Elasticsearch. Um, but uh, yeah, sounds like a cool project and it sounds like something that would, uh, you could throw together pretty quickly. And for what it's worth, uh, you'll notice that um, now as I add Elasticsearch nodes, uh, I had to kill everything. I had, I had some networking stuff, I think, going on. Um, now you can see that we're building out a cluster. I just added three new nodes to it. Why not? Let's make it four. Yes. All I'm running is dot bin slash Elasticsearch, and these nodes are just showing up, popping into the list, um, and Elasticsearch will even automatically start distributing the shards among those nodes as we have data to... Uh, to pull in. Yeah, See, now I'm seeing the smiling of like, the, that's the magic of Elasticsearch. That stuff is awesome. If you've ever set up other distributed systems, um, this is unusual that you just put them in the same network and they just find each other. 
And um, although they did invent their own magic for that. So uh, it's kind of got its own eccentricities, and like the fact that you might have already worked with a distributed system like Zookeeper might not actually mean you know how to troubleshoot their own magic Zen disco thing. But if, something, if something does go wrong, you can just blame it on the names, like um, Lady, who is it, something, wasn't up to it, but Lord Chaos is totally up to cluster. So, oh, so man. much so that he became the master. Hulk smash. Uh, Mark, you want to kick, uh, kick us off? Yeah, right. So, so uh, kind of by default, if you don't define um, a schema and map different um, document types to kind of what their structure is going to be, Elasticsearch just tries to figure it out. Now, a lot of the time, Elasticsearch kind of makes the right call and it works really nicely, uh, but it doesn't always. And depending on what your initial, what your first document that came in was, you could end up with an index different than what you want, and you can't change those mappings later without dropping the index and recreating it. So, um, right, if you want to make sure that you've described to Elasticsearch that that's not a long, it is a date. Um, right, you might want to tell it what that timestamp is, or Elasticsearch might guess wrong. And then when you go to start trying to do date range queries, saying like, "Find me all the stuff in this month," Elasticsearch has some magic for understanding dates. And if you didn't ahead of time create your index and tell it what that mapping was, um, then uh, you might not end up getting the kind of nice date indexing that you're looking for. Did I get any of that wrong, Mark? <laughs> Um, if you can afford Splunk, um, <laughs> Splunk's probably pretty good. If you have your laptop, if you have your laptop or one server, um, yeah, they're they're similar, right? So there's um, Splunk, uh, there's uh, Splunk on demand or whatever that one's called, Sumo Logic Logly. There's a bunch of like SaaS and um, uh, they, um, kind of licensed software that can help you do stuff like around log analysis and around the same stuff. And those are all great options. They just have different trade-offs in terms of cost and, uh, you know, cost to maintain. I think um, there is a big difference. Like, if you want to get excited and started playing with Elasticsearch, spin up one node and you're golden. The trouble is when you start to cluster it, that's when you kind of need to understand the different failure scenarios and that kind of thing. And how many replicas should I have? How many shards should I have? And so that there's kind of a, you know, uh, to operate a cluster, you kind of need to um, understand what's going on there. Um, so um, I'd say it's really just the o operational cost. If, if um, you know, if that makes sense for you and your business to like, as, if you're going to scale out a cluster, um, uh, there's an overhead to that. Uh, but the, the proprietary solutions um, uh, work for you as well. So. Yeah, right. Yeah, so my, go ahead. My model for securing Elasticsearch has always been the same as my model for securing Solar and Memcache and Redis, which is just like firewall it off and call it good. Um, communicate to it either over an unobservable LAN or, uh, or through an encrypted tunnel. Um, and there's there's probably other ways to do it, but like for the most part, you probably don't want people uh, hitting your Elasticsearch cluster from outside your data center anyway. Um, yeah, so a, a couple of quick things are, uh, you know, just like MySQL or anything else, the defaults are not necessarily your friend, and if you're trying to be secure, are probably not your friend. Um, so you'll need to, um, you know, look at those defaults. Uh, I think, um, yeah, just uh, um, not exposing it externally is great. Basic stuff like IP tables, you know, fronting it with Nginx, fronting it with SSL are all cool ideas and pretty easy to do. Um, also, one kind of easy thing you can do with Nginx is um, restrict based on the HTTP method. So you can at least kind of say, hey, if you come in through this domain or whatever, um, you know, you're, 
you're only doing gets. Um, so then that's more of a data integrity aspect, but you also need to uh, understand um, uh, the conf confidentiality parts of that as well. But. Yeah. Oh, uh, one other but, gotcha. But a good note for sure. So, uh, you know, if you're starting to play around and you get some log data or something, there very often can be sensitive data in there, and so uh, you know, it's on you to make sure that's secure. Uh, one other gotcha with hooking up Elasticsearch and Kibana. By default, Elasticsearch, uh, that, that actually is one reason that you might want to allow uh, Elasticsearch to um, be accessible from outside because I think Kibana hits its API directly. Yeah. Um, you need to set a flag in the Elasticsearch config to turn on cores, allowing headers so that the Elast the Logstash instance can talk to the Elasticsearch instance. Uh, the documentation is all inside our examples folder inside this presentation. So, and I think we have got to yeah. cut it off. Cool. We'll we'll uh, we'll grab anyone has any questions. Good question. We'll jump into that uh, with you right now. Thank you. Sorry, guys. Thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry.